Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Sci-Fi Wire live stage at New York Comic-Con. <laughs> Day numero uno. And, boy, what a treat now, right? Look at, look, there's a really big crowd here, and they're here to see this man right here, the great Todd McFarlane. Thank Give it up. You, thank you. New York City, we love you. There's always so much to talk with you about, um, and we're gonna get to uh, a certain character named Spawn in a second, but you were at the premiere of a movie based on another character you helped create earlier this week, Venom. I was wondering what your take on the movie was and seeing him on the screen again. So, so here's, and this may be interesting, and I don't mean to dodge an answer, but we started Image Comic Books a long time, 26 years ago, so that we could go out and artistically do whatever we wanted, the way we wanted, and nobody could tell us how to do it. So I actually give that freedom to everybody, right? So whether you do a book for us, or you do a movie or a TV show, so I don't go to a movie like Venom now, and I watched it, and I don't go, hey, how would I have done it? You know, how come they're not talking to me? I don't do that. I go, it's their choice, they're doing creative, they're spending their hundred million. They have a lot to say, and I just sort of look at the choices they make and go, huh, might, might not have been where I went, but it's, they have the freedom. I only went, ladies and gentlemen, to see one thing. I don't know if you guys saw Spider-Man number three where they had uh, Venom in that, and what, what, what was a little disappointing to me, although it's still their choice, is that you had Topher Grace and then when he turned into Venom, he only got like 20 pounds heavier, right? Look at, now I can get 20 pounds heavier. Watch this, you just hold your breath. And he, that's all he did. It was like Topher, Venom, Topher, Venom. And it didn't really seem much different to me. And I, when I created Venom, I created- Do that one more time, do that one more time. Topher, Venom. It's true, right? <laughs> and you get there, right? So all I wanted to see in this movie was just one thing. I had one box. Give me a big guy, because that's what I designed. I designed big. It was big, massive, I, over the yes, top. Yes, yeah. and, so, and yeah, he swallowed up Tom Hardy in this thing, so he was big. And the reason I did that, I don't have any input in what they do with the movie. When I created Venom, I wanted him to be big. And there's a reason I want him to be big, because when you're drawn artistically, you have to sort of have fun. Spider-Man, to me, was one finger. Right? Because he's a little skinny guy, right? A little high school guy, college guy, a little skinny guy. And here's Venom. Venom was four fingers. One, four. And if you have four against one like that, there's no way that Spider-Man can beat him physically. It's a fool's fight. If you go to Vegas, put your, put your money on Venom, because he's going to win every time. So now Spider-Man had to start using some intelligence to beat him, and then I just threw that to the writer going, you can't just make it a fist fight, because this guy will clobber Spider-Man, go and come up with something else, and they did it. So to me, it was all about the physicality, and I got to see some big, some big ass v Venom that was out there, so. Well, let's be honest, the only reason Venom even exists is because you really wanted to draw Spider-Man in the classic costume. Right, so. And you wanted him out of the black costume, right, so correct? You, so I don't know if you guys have heard this story, it's true. I would like to say that the creation of Venom was really smart and intelligent and well thought out. It wasn't. What happened was, no, it's true. What happened was I was doing a Hulk and I was able to do more than one book. So I went to the other offices to try and pick up a second book. I went into the Spider-Man office and they said, hey, we've got an opening, you wanna do Spider-Man? Yeah, cool, Spider-Man, I, I know him, that'd be cool. And then they go, well, you can take over the Amazing Spider-Man on 298, which I did. But he was in the black costume. If any of you were collecting at that time, you know he was in the black costume. And to me, I went, that's not Spider-Man. So I don't care he had a white spider on his chest. It wasn't Spider-Man. Any more than if you took Batman and you put him in a yellow suit, but you put a bat on him, that's not Batman. I want, I want, I want Batman's suit. I want Superman. I want Spider-Man. So I said, I'll take over Spider-Man on one condition. We get rid of that black costume. It's ridiculous. Now, the editor-in-chief had some part in bringing that black costume to Marvel. So they didn't want to get rid of it. So they go, Todd, we can't get rid of it. The editor-in-chief likes it, Jim Shooter. I'm like, this is easy. Just take it off and we'll create another character. No big deal. Here, just give it to me. I'll do some cool designs. 
da 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 to the whole time I'm going, ah, oh, not, oh, cool, Venom, Venom, Venom. We didn't even have a name at that point. It was, oh, cool, I get to draw Spider-Man in his red and blue costume. That's why I got the black off. I wanted the red and blue costume. And so we go, then create a character, we'll call him Venom. What do we give a shit? And then we put it over here, and we put it on him, and it was this big hulking guy, the monster, all the things I said. And then later, it was funny, David Michelinie, who was the writer, then comes up to me and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to put this journalist, Eddie Brock, in it. Duh. Ugh. Information I could have used earlier, right? <laughs> so I, I, what are you talking about? Eddie Brock is one finger, too. I, I go, if I would have known that, Venom would have been skinny because I would have just made him as big as a human. I thought he was a monster. I created a monster. So it was like, well, you're just going to have to make it that he gets absorbed or something. He likes like, weights. <laughs> something. So I would, like I said, we would all like to say that we knew we were casting this big rock in the water that was going to turn into something. But I was just playing on some cool visuals. And now we're here 30 years later and they're making a movie. So who knew? Incredible. Speaking of movies, you're in the process of getting ready to make yours on Spawn. Pardon me? Yeah, we've, we've kind of talked about the once or twice. You're getting ready to make Spawn, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. What, did you forget? <laughs> no, I couldn't hear the question. Yeah. So, How close are we to seeing you going to production? You, you've cast Jamie Foxx as Al Simmons. You've got Jeremy Renner right. uh, as, as Switch. Greg, Greg, Greg Nicotero. Greg Nicotero is on board. you got Walking Jason Blum yeah. producing, as you call it, the Triple J's and a G. Right. What's He's, next? What's next? Here's what's next, is getting Hollywood to get this, right? They, they're still a little timid of doing a true, dark, nasty, R-rated superhero. As soon as you say superhero, they, they sort of go into a little bit of a default. So we're still trying to get them across the finish line to just go, come on. The weak link in this whole thing is me. But we've got Spawn, we've got Jamie, all those people you mentioned, Greg and Jason. I'm going to surround myself with an Academy Award winning uh, director of photography. It will look good. The acting will be good. Stop thinking of this as a traditional superhero movie because they go, how come Spawn's not in it more? How come this? How? And they, all the comments are based upon superhero PG-13 thinking. And I, I still, I, we showed it to a couple people last week in the studio. You could see they were a little bit. and. I, the mistake we made, I think, and I told my agent, you didn't let me go in the room. I need to go into the room. I need to sell it. I need to tell them what the frame is of this picture that is the script that they're about to read because they still keep going into the superhero default, and it doesn't make sense. If you read my script with the superhero mode, it's confusing. You'd go like your dog. You'd go, I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Think about it as a scary movie that will just get people to just be mesmerized by Jeremy Renner's acting and his character, and then, oh yeah, fuck, that's right, Spawn's in this movie, right? And he comes. And then when Spawn comes, he's not owned by corporate America. I don't care about selling t-shirts and hats. So when Spawn comes, you're the bad guy. You better not want to be a bad guy, because when Spawn comes, it's just, it's nice and calm. There's Jeremy Renner, and then, what? and you're gone and he will mess you up and he will do it in a harsh way and he doesn't care if he's selling any toys or t-shirts right so they just i just we need to keep nudging them just a little bit more to just go i think this audience is old enough i think you actually are hungry for the same thing i'm hungry for which is nasty right yeah What's that? Are you guys excited yeah. to see a Spawn movie like that? I believe you're correct. Ah, ah. So we're getting closer, we're getting closer. And you, you just talked about it. You really want this movie to scare the crap out of people, right? How important is Greg Nicotero to helping you achieve that goal right. visually? How, how is he going to do it? It's a, look at Greg Nicotero, for all you guys don't know, he's directed more Walking Dead shows than anybody else. And he actually does award-winning costumes. We've already designed them. And the great thing about, Nick, about Greg is that because he's a director, when I was trying to explain what I was going to do on screen visually, he was going, oh, he could understand what that meant. When I, look at, when I use words in the script that says, uh, Al transforms into Spawn, 
we all have a vision of it. You, some of you are Spawn fans, you have a vision of it. I, I, haven't shown what, I haven't shown what I want to do in a movie ever in the comic book, right? I want, I, it's a different kind of transformation. And Greg gets it, and we designed it so that we could show it. I just don't think that the, that the studio guys are getting it, because they're going, you're going to need too big of a special effects budget. No, no, no. Not the way that I want to do it. I think there's another way to put something on the screen that just is just odd and, and weird. And here, look at, here's, here's what I'm hoping. At the end of the movie, that you guys walk out of there and you go, I don't quite get it. I don't quite understand how that all worked, but shit, that looked cool, man. <laughs> like, wow, like, I don't know, who cares how I got there? If it's just cool, cool is good enough. And if I can bring that for two hours, who cares when I did it with special effects or I did it some other interesting way? We just got there, right? I just, I, look at, when I was a kid, there was a movie that really made an impact on me called uh, uh, Jacob's Ladder. And Jacob's Ladder, for any of you who seen it, I was young. I didn't even know what the hell I was watching. I just know it was something bizarre to the day that now I'm over 50 and I still remember that movie. That's how much of an impact it had. It was like, what the hell was that? Like, I saw stuff on the screen that I don't know what it meant, but it was just so messed up and cool and crazy and insane that I just loved it. And, and so I'm just hoping to do some of those kinds of visuals. I think I can do it, com most of it, without any kind of special effects. Have you gotten Jeremy Renner and Jamie Foxx together in a room yet? No, we, no, we haven't, because uh, w once we get sort of the sign-off on the studios, then I owe an obligation to go back to them to let them do their notes. And what I don't want to do is do Jamie's notes and then find out that Jeremy needs to undo it or vice versa. Probably what I'll end up doing is see if I can get them both in the same room so that we're not talking past each other and we're not basically fixing something to have them taken apart. They both know what they want. I've explained to Jamie that he's not going to talk a whole hell of a lot in the first movie. In the first movie, I, I'm selling it as a trilogy, right? That I go and each movie will look different than the last one, so the first... Uh, they're no, excited, they're excited. No, no, yeah. They like that, that news. But, but here's the thing about the trilogy, that I've seen lots of trilogy, that a lot of trilogies go back and repeat the last thing. I want each movie to then be visually different on each one so that you go, I saw that movie two years ago. I don't want that, I don't want that to be. So the first, if I, if I had to give a title to the first movie, it would be Spawn dot dot dot, do you believe? Do you believe? Because again, do you, it, everybody in this movie is going to be going, I don't even know if this exists, or whether it's just in my head, or whether it's a boogeyman, or whether it's physical. Once you get past that, which will then will be there, like probably at the halfway point in the movie, but once you get past that, the second movie then becomes completely different. Because now people will be talking to each other different, because the first movie was, I'm crazy, I've got to shake my head, I don't even know if you exist. So, but the second movie, I know you exist, I can have a different conversation, right? So, you don't, you know, it, it's funny because the studio is going, well, why doesn't Twitch ask this question and this question and this question? And I go, because he doesn't think it's real. He think it's a ghost, right? So here's what I know. If I saw my dead grandma in a room, I probably wouldn't ask her questions. I'd say to myself, Todd, you need to get some sleep tonight. That's it. You don't start going up the figments of your imagination and having, conversations with them you just go wow i i've been working too hard that's what you do so so that's that's sort of the setup that we'll get to so that we can then go bigger so that by part three we get into all the cool crazy stuff and may maybe introduce some of those villains that people are looking for yeah you know i, I was i was figuring this out while preparing for the interview if you time it right you may be in production or close to finishing production on the film as issue 300 of spawn comes around, you know, one of the, the longest running uh, continuous in, independent comic book. Uh, wait, wait, close. Wait, right. So let's right. So let's, so let, one let's, of them. I I I am I am. Here's what I'm excited about: Spawn, not issue 300, which you guys all like because it's anniversary books, right? Be thick, it'd be fat. I might even come back and draw one of the chapters myself. So we'll get some cool stuff oh, in it. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, it's issue 301, and issue 301 is important to me personally because it will now be the single longest running independent comic book in American history, right? So right. 
I go and uh, issue three, like issue 300 ties the record with Cerebus the Aardvark. If any of you guys ever collected that, if you haven't, take a look at it. It's a spectacular run. Dave Sim did this from one to 300, and then and he said at the beginning, I'm going to do 300 and quit. True to his word, he did 300 and he quit. So to me, the record is 301, and now I go, wow, I'll have, I'll have the record that's there. And to get to 301, that's roughly 28 years, 20 something like that, 28 years to get to 300. So there's no, there's no quick way to do that many issues. So we're going to have some fun. There's going to be a bit of a morph a morphing of Spawn and his powers and his costume at issue 300, too. So I got the story already worked out as we're heading to it. It's quite amazing, not just how long and how successful the character has been, and you've, you know, morphed him into a, a merchandising beast with your toys and all the other stuff, but what's crazy is that you've had so many different creators come on board and put their hand in the, in the Spawn character, which is really the way to turn a cool character into an eternal character. Batman doesn't become Batman if Bob Kane is only working on him, right? right, right. Spider-Man doesn't become Spider-Man if it's just Stan and Steve. You know, you created Spawn in high school, and you, you launched him, and you took over, and then, you know, you had your, you got a little busy with, with other stuff, and you were smart enough to bring in so many different guys, and people... Yeah, I've, I've been fortunate with some of the great... You, you, you the found great some great writers yeah. and, and artists who really loved the character and really understood it, took him in different directions. How important is that? for the creator of a character to understand that, to really make your character timeless, okay, you let, let, spread let me, out. Let me, let me simplify it a little bit. So I get people come up to me and they go, hey, Todd, you, you seem to be changing the direction of Spawn and you're sort of, you know, making it more of a creep thing from a superhero. Why would you do that? There's really only one answer. Because the guy who created him in 1992, 26 years ago, 27 years ago, the first issue, I actually created him in high school is the same guy writing the book today, right? Let me tell you right now, if you have any idea that you want to put on paper or a song or something, and you do that same thing over and over and over for 26 years and you don't change it, you will go insane, right? I'm telling you, I don't know any creative person that goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do these 10 stories with Spawn or Spider-Man or Iron Man or Batman, and then I'm gonna repeat it over and over and over for 30 years. Here's what I believe. I believe this would be the truth. If Stan Lee did Spider-Man for 30 years and didn't take a break, Spider-Man would have evolved even more because Stan Lee wouldn't have wanted to do his own stories. But what ends up happening is that Stan does it for 40 issues, then you bring on a new writer and he's fresh and eager, and he goes, I'm gonna do Stan for 40 issues. And then the next person comes along and goes, I'm gonna do that guy and Stan, and everybody's just repeating the same 40 issues with the same characters, so that you're now 200, 300 issues into it, and you're still getting the lizard story that is essentially the Stan Lee lizard story, which is why when I did the lizard, I go, I'm gonna make him a monster, right? And they're like, you can't do that. He's always been this way, but why? So, Kurt Connors, he right, lost an arm. Yeah. Right. So, so the reason Spawn has to evolve is because I, I'm getting older, ladies and gentlemen. I'm getting older just like you. And what, what I enjoyed, what I liked when I was 20 are not the same things that I like when I'm 50. And so I have to acknowledge for me, for my entertainment, that I'm getting older, which is why the direction of the movie is my acknowledgement that the fan base is getting older. When Spawn came out, the movie came out in 1997. I'll never forget, I sat down with the president of New Line Cinema, and he told me on Monday a, a number that I never forgot. He said, Todd, we do all this uh, graphing and data. 75% of the people that went to that movie were 14 or older. 75% were 14 or older. And I went, wow, wow. So that means, how many were then from 14 to 17? Oh, that was another 19%. So I go, so you're saying in three years, almost 100% of that audience is going to be able to go to an R-rated movie. And I go, shoot, I know what that next movie is going to be. It's going to be R-rated if I have any say into it. Well, that was 20 years ago, so here it is. If you were a zygote 20 years ago, you can now go to an R-rated movie, right? So everybody can go to an R-rated movie since the last one. I, I, I just, I gotta deliver it. I've gotta deliver that 
it, it may be a dismal failure, but I just have to get it out of my system and then go there. It's out because nobody's doing it. Do you? Here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to make a bet. I, I hope I'm wrong. And I second hope, gambling I, reference. I'm I starting to worry you about you. Can all <laughs> ridicule me? I do not believe that the Joker movie is going to be a hard R. I don't believe it. It's going to be a hard Warner Brothers R. That's different than a hard Todd R. My definition of hard and their definition of hard, right? Dude, mine, mine is way there. If they gave me the Joker and said, ah, do whatever you want with it, here's the first thing that I would do. First off, don't bring your children because they will cry. So, and if you bring your children and they cry, then mom's going to have to leave because dad's going to dig it. So mom's going to leave and she goes, this is, this is horrible. I don't know why anybody would do it. And they'd get the hell out. And I go, because I'm going to show adult insanity on that screen for adults because it's R-rated. I don't care if I sell a T-shirt. So, yeah. so, so we've discovered a new film rating system. So let's <laughs> ask this question. And I hope I'm wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Do I believe that they will go so hard with the Joker that then the next time the Joker has to appear in Batman, that has to be PG-13. It has to be PG-13. That now they're going to go, no, let's go Joker, then let's go insane cool, get us all worked up in a lather, and then go, oh, we want to put him in Batman. we got to downgrade him back to, to PG-13, and it's going to be a watered-down version. They can't. So what they're going to do is nudge it. I, my belief, they're going to nudge it. They're not going to go crazy. Right, so good thing I'm not owned by a corporation. I can go insane. I can do whatever I want with Spawn. So I can't wait for that movie to come out because I, I want to get your take on it. I'm do, I, yeah, I want to do Joker Part Two. <laughs> That's it. Okay, uh, can, can we play a little game? Do it. We, we call it Uopedia, where we ask you a couple of trivia. Uopedia. Uopedia? It, yeah, it's some trivia questions that we found on Wikipedia and the internet about you, and we all know that the internet never lies. Oh, okay. is this information that's out there? Yeah, yeah. You should know this stuff. It's I about don't have herpes. <laughs> yeah. Think of the children, Todd. Think of the children. Okay. Okay, what was the final issue of Spawn that you inked? Wow. That I inked would have been issue... Uh, wow. What, probably one, uh, one of the, the Wills Protasio issues. So that would have issue been... Issue 70. No, no, no. Wikipedia is... That's what the internet no, says. The, the internet's wrong. <laughs> I, 70? What are you talking about? I did a bunch of inking all the way up to 100 on Greg's but stuff. But that was your... As guests, did you regularly ink the other artists? D dude, I know my life. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm the, gaslighting the you now. The internet is wrong I'm on this one. I'm gaslighting McFarlane you, you now. You know what? I, I, I this think, one we can agree on. No, I think that was somebody at Boom Comics that put it on there <laughs> just to mess with me. Okay, here's one. On the cover of Amazing Spider-Man 328. 328. Kind of a legendary issue that most of us probably remember. Who is Spidey punching and which arm is he punching him with? Wow, he's punching the Gray Hulk who has a green tongue because the, cause I made sure there was a little bit of green because I know eventually he was going to go green. So if you've never seen the cover, take a look. He's got a green tongue. And he's not punching him in the stomach. He's actually punching him in the nutsack. And if you, no, take a look at it. So they wouldn't let me punch him in the nutsack. So if you do comic book stuff, there it is. Look at, look at it. Look at, here's the thing. If you put the little, what we call comic book surprise lines, then it's like, oh, they thought he was getting punched in the stomach. It's in the nutsacks, ladies and gentlemen. So. Right. How else are you gonna beat the Hulk, right? <laughs> Good. You know, but that, that, that cover was a great example of what you brought to comics and what you changed about comics. The cover, are, the, the, the design of the covers that, that, that you, you know, those designs that you came up with were so ingenious. Like, were they, did they pop in your head or were, was it a lot of trial and error and erasing going back? Look, look at, I don't think, I don't think people, if you stop and think about it, I don't think people understand people who create novelists, people who write songs. Here's what the occupation is is you in a room by yourself for 10 hours a day. That's the job. You're at a table by yourself, especially if you're writing, because you, you don't want people chatting to you while you're trying to type. You're by yourself for 10 to 12 hours a day. And if you aren't entertaining yourself at some level, you're gonna go crazy. 
So everything I did, I hate to say it, the first person I was entertaining was me because I had a blank piece of paper and I go, what would be fun to draw? Oh, Spidey hitting Hulk in the nut sacks and breaking through the thing. That's cool. That's fun to draw, right? So it, it, it gets you through the deadline. Here's the other thing. That cover that they just show, it went up to auction. Somebody paid $660,000. $660,000 for the original artwork on that, right? I. I remember who I gave it to. I traded it to them for $800 of hockey cards, right? It's true. So when, when that page went up for auction, it was that page and you know the cover to Spider-Man 1 where he's in all the webs, right? The classic one where he's in the crouch. That page went for 380,000. The record was like 440,000 for a Dark Knight, Frank Miller page. I thought that one, the Spider-Man 1 cover was gonna break the record. Went for 380. Ah. The second one went for 660, so, and it was the same person, and I, he gave me $1,500 total of hockey cards that he probably bought for $112, and he got a million bucks, but I'll never forget, my daughter, the God bless the internet, my daughter comes running downstairs, and she comes with her cell phone, and she goes, oh my God, Dad, oh my God, a million dollars, I'm going to the school of my choice, I'm going to the college of my choice, and then Mom, my dear wife went, uh, Kate, my daughter, uh, Kate, let's just slow down and let's just ask your father a few questions. One, did your dad sell them? Two, if your dad didn't sell them, what did he sell them for? And three, whatever he sold it for, does it even have those damn hockey cards, right? <laughs> and at the end of that conversation, and you, anybody's got teenage kids, you're a dumbass, Dad, right? <laughs> right? And it's like, but wait. Look at, look at, here's, look, you will never see the story. You will never see the story that goes like this. Painting a famous artist goes for five million. Painter owned every single one of them. No, 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 no. It's painting goes for five million. Artist dies penniless under a bridge. That's usually the story of the artist. True. But there, here's why this, here's why those bring, pages you got are one expensive. more thing to bring up too. Here's no, why those that. pages are expensive. Because when I left Marvel in 19, late 1991, I, I vowed I'd never sell another page. And I haven't. So people are now scrumming for the same number of pages. I haven't added one page in 26 years to that pool. So the cost keeps going up, 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 up. So, Counter to what I just said, you know who has every single page of Todd McFarlane artwork for Spawn? <laughs> so, someday, someday I'll maybe, I'll sell issue number one intact, intact. You'll get the cover, the color cover, the black and white cover, and all the interior pages, and all my notes in one fell swoop. You'll get it intact. Nobody's got it intact. And I know who's going to buy that. And it'll be Kirkman. Robert because Kirkman. Robert Kirkman right. is begging yeah. you to sell your art. He does. Robert, okay. every, he reminds me, if you're ever going to sell it, you're selling it to me. By the way, it. fun fact, if you ever visit uh, McFarland's uh, headquarters in Phoenix and you get lucky to check it out, it's amazing, there's a, there's a copy of that Hulk 328 cover that you keep up there yeah. just to troll that just, guy. I just, love it. Just to, just to torture my daughter. Okay. We have one more game. We're going to roll for questions. You're going to roll the dice and we're going to pick a question based on that number. Totally uh, random oh, you question. Got a, oh, you got a random question? Oh, yeah. Go. Roll the dice. And the... Uh, do, question four. number four, Fantastic Four. Okay, question number four. If you could somehow talk to your younger self, what would you tell them if you wanted to blow their tiny mind? Um, <laughs> this, one, this one might actually be a little bit easy. Todd, don't get into the toy business. <laughs> it's way more complicated than I thought, right? <laughs> when I Look at here, here's how I usually start companies. Somebody says, you can't do that. And then I get pissed off. And when I'm mad, I usually start companies because I'm very competitive. So I, I was the same way. I basically, it's just it's how teenagers act, right? Mom and dad say, be home by 11. I always came home at 11.15, right? Always 11.15, just to see if, how much I could push it. So I started the toy company because they said, ah, we can't do those kinds of toys you're talking about, Todd. And I went, what are you talking about? Just plastic. So I, I got mad at all the big companies and I went, I'm gonna start my own company because I'm gonna do cool art. It's always about cool art. You do cool looking art and you price it right, people will come. And then uh, the stuff, 
And now this is the businessman part of it. I consider myself to be bilingual. I can talk to you about art, and I've learned this other language called business. And, I, and I've learned the second language so that I can deliver my art. And I need enough success on the business so I can keep delivering the art. That's why I need to be a solid businessman. So I have to understand the business to do the art. But do I know all the plastic government sanctioned do's and don'ts of shipping product from China? Yes, and it's boring, it's boring. So I, there's just a lot of headaches to go with it because you're dealing on a bigger scale. Comic books is way cooler, so yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Todd McFarlane. Oh, thank you everybody, thank you, thank you. Stick around, guys. Keep following the It's a Fan Thing hashtag from all the fun stuff here at New York Comic Con. And coming up next, we've got the voice cast of Constantine, City of Demons. Hi, I'm Jackie Jennings with Sci-Fi Wire. If you can't get enough of New York Comic Con, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for news, interviews, cosplay, and so much more. What are you waiting for?